You're listening to Spotlight, the podcast that fosters connections with veterans and military spouses. Here's your host, Bob Lowden. Welcome, everybody. This is Bob Lowden. Welcome to the Veteran Crowd Spotlight. Very pleased to have as my guest today, Jason Van Camp. He's a 2001 graduate of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He's the chairman of Mission 6-0 and executive director of Warrior Rising. He's also the author of the book, Deliberate Discomfort. Jason, welcome to the program. Thanks for joining me today. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, uh, let, let's go back. Let's talk about young Jason growing up. Where'd you grow up? How'd you end up coming to West Point? Uh, played a little football uh, before we kind of get into the meat here. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a Virginia guy. So I uh, grew up in Springfield, Virginia. I was born in D.C. And, uh, you know, I grew up right outside in the suburbs. And, um, you know, my father was in I worked for the government, worked at the AMC building in Alexandria, Virginia for a long time. My mother worked for Delta Airlines. Uh, I've got a younger brother and a younger sister. And, you know, growing up in that area, there's a lot of military and government um, families. And yeah. so that was sort of normal. And so, um, you know, I played a lot of sports growing up. was pretty good at, at, uh, at sports and ended up getting a chance to go to West Point. And I played a little football when I was there as well. What was your position? in uh, football? I was a linebacker. So I, I always had that linebacker mentality. It's funny because uh, <clears throat> my dad wanted me to play football when I was in seventh grade. And although we played football in the park, you know, and things like that, mm -hmm. I hadn't really gotten into football. So I didn't really know the positions. And so uh, I remember the guy in front of me as we were in seventh grade and we were in a line and we were walking up to the coach and the coach would say, what position do you want to play on offense? What position <clears throat> do you want to play on defense? And I was like, man, I was panicking a little bit because I was like, I don't even know the names of the positions. I don't know. <laughs> and the guy in front of me said running back and linebacker. And so when he asked me, what do you want to play? I just said what he said. I said running back and linebacker. And he said, OK. And that was uh, the beginning of my, of my linebacking career. Haphazardly walked into it. Which high, I'm curious which high school you played for up in uh, outside of Springfield. Yeah, so I was at West Springfield High School. Okay. And uh, the Spartans, you know, um, my my junior year, we were we almost made it to states. We lost in the regional championship. Um, There's know, a few but, good football. Were you, div, you know, the Division Five or Six? Uh, do you remember? Pretty big uh, high school. Yeah, it's I, I forget what they called it. Was it class? I yeah, it's class five, six are the two class largest in Virginia. We were the largest at yeah. the time. We were the largest. I'm pretty sure we're still in that division now or that class now. Yeah. Some, some good football in that division. Highland Springs yeah, down here in Richmond and Massaponics up your way. And of course, TC Williams was up there. To, you know, uh, you probably played them. Uh, they were in our district. Yeah. So yeah. we were five teams in our district. TC Williams. Remember the Titans. They yeah. Were, remember the Titans. Awesome movie. Awesome. In our, in our time, they were, they were the worst. They were always last place, man. They were the, uh, we always beat. Yeah, they went from the top to the doormat, huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hey, um, so so let's jump into your uh, army career. You get out of West Point, good timing, two thousand and one. You know, uh, just got lined up for all this activity. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about right uh, that experience. Yeah, time to just right for nine eleven, right? So, yeah. uh, we went to OBC, the officer base, of course, and it started. It's funny how West Point works, man. You graduate in, in June and then you got to report to your next unit like by the end of June. So it's like, you know, give us some time off, you know, like give us some time to breathe before we get a chance to, to, to get back into it. Um, and uh, went to Oklahoma for my officer basic training and 9-11 hit and it changed everything. You, know, you can we be were, an artillery officer? I was originally? an artillery guy, you know. Okay, Fort Sill. Fort Sill, you know, lot in Oklahoma, you know, uh, one gas station, two strip clubs, you know, at the time, you know, <laughs> lot in Oklahoma, but I enjoyed no, no, no pawn shops. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a few of those, but it was, I enjoyed Oklahoma. It was, it was, it was a fun time. And, um, we did a lot of physical training, getting ready to go to Ranger school 
And, uh, you know, went to Oklahoma City uh, quite a bit with, with the other officers there and had a great time there. But 9-11 changed everything, man. We were, at the time, thinking we were an army that was training, you know, and we would get promoted based upon our, our you know, PT scores, you know, and then whether or not our, our, uh, our commander liked us, you know, essentially into now we're going to war. And all that, all that stuff, it's not as important anymore. Now we're, we're actually going to combat. We have to lead. Lives are at stake. You know, our country's goals, values, and, and um, all the strategic implications are at place as well. So it was a very, very uh, somber moment, you know, standing at the Fort Sill uh, basic course, watching, you know, the towers go down, you know, right. on, on a small TV set behind a cafe, you know, hundreds of of second lieutenants going through the course outside in the hallway, just watching this go down. Now I'll never forget that. You got real in a hurry. Yeah, I did. Where did you, where were you assigned after uh, OBC? So I was, uh, I volunteered to go to ranger school. And so we started with over a hundred guys and we finished with 12 guys in December, late December, just before Christmas. And we went home for Christmas. And then I went to ranger school in January. I think January, third or something like that and that was so Fort Benning Georgia is where I went next uh was out in the woods for two and a half months mm -hmm. in ranger school and then I went to airborne school right after so I went to ranger school as a as a leg you know I wasn't airborne qualified at the time which I highly recommend if anybody's willing to interested in going that route and right after airborne school I went to my first unit in Korea and I was stationed at Camp Giant uh, in Munsan, Korea. So up near the DMZ and uh, really enjoyed myself there. It's a good time. You uh, uh, eventually made the decision to uh, go to the Q school for special forces. I did. I, uh, right after Korea, I went um, to the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And I, I deployed in the initial invasion of, of Iraq. And I was there for about a year and I got my first taste of combat, you know, and I, and I saw how things were, were and were operating. And I really kind of fell in love with the, the oppressor Lee Bear, the, the free the oppressed mm -hmm. mindset, you know, the mindset of the, the special forces, the, the Green Berets. And uh, I had some friends that were trying out for the Green Berets. One in particular was my best friend and he convinced me to try out with him. And ultimately he didn't make it and I did. And um, I, I, I truly, you know, people laugh at me when I tell them I enjoyed my time in the Q course and selection. It's hard, no doubt, physically demanding, you know, spiritually demanding, emotionally demanding, mentally challenging, but you learn so much, you grow up, you become stronger and tougher. You learn about, a lot about yourself and about the people to your left and to your right. And it was just a community that I wanted to be a part of. And I'm glad that I was a part of it. I'm going to come back, circle back on that particular topic uh, when we're talking a little bit about your book, because you've woven a lot of stories into the into the narrative of your book. But uh, tell me, let's let's talk uh, first about Mission Six Zero. So unlike traditional leadership training, Mission Six Zero makes leadership actionable through the total warrior process. Let's let's talk about the company, the foundation, and and I, it. It, we need to explain where Mission Six Zero comes from, uh, if, if you'd walk us through the, the name of the company, too. Sure, sure. So I'll give you the story first, then I'll, I'll describe the name. Don't let me forget about it. So uh, I was getting my master's, my MBA at BYU, and they gave us an opportunity to go uh, create a business, and sort of a business competition and sort of thing. And, and I said, you know, if I'm going to do this, I want to start a business um, that I'm knowledgeable about and that I'm passionate about. And I started thinking, well, what's that for me? And I thought, well, I just, you know, spent the last 18 years of my life, you know, at, at West Point and in the military, going to combat, you know, Ranger School, you know, Green Beret, you know, doing all this stuff. I, I guess I know a lot about leadership and team building and, and culture. And I'm passionate about sports. I've always played sports growing up and I, and I watch a lot of sports on TV. I go to a lot of games in person. I, 
I'm passionate about my, my DC sports teams, you know, the, the Redskins now, the football team and, and the Nats in particular. And I thought, what if there's a way that we could combine those two, two things together where we could um, create a program, a curriculum and go to sports teams and deliver it in the form of providing leadership, culture, team building uh, experiences. And so I knew I didn't want to do this by myself. And so I went and recruited some of the best leaders I've ever met in my military career. Guys uh, that were not only Green Berets, but, you know, Navy SEALs and Marines and Rangers and all sorts of guys, uh, former commanders, former subordinates, former peers, you know, the whole thing. And uh, we got them all into a room essentially and said, hey, this is my idea. What do you guys think? And most of them said, yeah, let's do it, Jay. You know, you, you take point, you lead this thing and, and I got your back and let's do it. And so I started cold calling NFL teams. You know, I found a list on Google of NFL teams. I found out who the person is I need to call. And I just, you know, alphabetically, Arizona Cardinals, Atlanta Falcons, Buffalo Bills, Carolina Panthers. And I finally got to the New York Jets after 20 plus hard no's. You know, and after each hard no, I I learned something. You know, this is the person I need to talk to. This is what they want to hear. These are the dates, you know, that they, they consider working with people. And I got to the Jets and I talked to a guy named Dave Zott and he used to play guard, all pro guy for the Chiefs and for the Jets and for the Redskins. And he's a guy that I just so happened to follow. I, I just thought he was an interesting player. And so I knew a lot about him. And I knew some of his stats and, and we sort of hit it off. He said, well, Jason, listen, you know, this is your first time doing something like this, you know, just for experience, experience's sake, you can come up here on your own dime and present to the team, but you know, there's no guarantees and you're not going to get this contract and it'll just be um, chalk it up to, to gain some experience. And I said, thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. I'll take you up on that. And so I got together with two of my guys and we went up to New York and we presented to the team and we hit it out of the park and, and the coaching staff said, uh, you know, we want to hire you. So you, you got an audience with Rex Ryan. Is that in the first meeting? Yeah, that was our first ever contract with Rex Ryan and the coaches there. And, we threw a flashbang and dressed up as terrorists and threw them on the ground and, you know, gave them a taste of what we could bring to the table. And I knew we were going to bring it. You know, we were, you know, group, group of green berets, man. We we're going to lay it on the line. We weren't going to lose out to any uh, other company. And so uh, we brought it, you know, we, we got it. Like I knew we would. And did you uh, literally throw a flashbang grenade in the conference room and storm in there? <laughs> yeah, we did, but it wasn't a real flashbang. You know, it was it was a, a tempered one, and, and uh, it still made a really loud noise and a, and a flash and everything. But it wasn't like an official flashbang. But we did that, and uh, you know, you got to take risks sometimes. If you want to, if you want to land a big fish, man, you got to take risks. You got to set yourself apart. You got to do something big, or you got to go home. And, I, I don't uh, know Rex Ryan, but I bet he loved that. He did. And we didn't know him either. We didn't know if like within five minutes they were, they were going to throw us out of the office. And I would have said, you know what, lesson learned. We won't do that again next time. But for this time, <laughs> Rex, he was laughing. He loved it. He thought we were great. You know, he, he loved the message. He loved everything about us. And, and the more we saw him get excited, the more we got excited. And, and it was just, a, it was a great experience. So that was the beginning. That was the origin of Mission Six Zero. And uh, since then, you know, the NFL is a small world, so they start talking. And if you make a good impression and you've got a reputation, then they're going to hire you for other events. And then we've got into the baseball and some other sports. And then we've got into the corporate world, which is really where we make our money in the corporate world. Uh, but Mission Six Zero initially was called Mission Essential. Uh -huh. And we called it that because nobody on the team could agree on the name. You know, so every idea we had for a name, uh, some people really liked it and other people would shoot it down, you know? And so after months of trying to decide what we're going to call ourselves, I finally made the command decision and said, Hey, it's mission essential. I know some of you guys hate it. I don't care. I am not particularly fond of it either, but it's mission essential. And then, uh, like, I think three years later, this company, um, called Aegis, they, it's kind of a really shitty deal with them. They, reached out to me with a cease and desist and they stole my logo. They stole the name mission essential and they stole everything really. And they said, Hey, uh, we're going to use this now. We're rebranding our company to mission essential. You can no longer call yourself this. 
And so obviously I was pissed and I was like, you guys hadn't trademarked the name or anything. I was a young guy in the business. I didn't know about copyright and trademark and all that stuff. And, you know, I hired a lawyer, they hired a lawyer. We went to battle for about a year. And finally my lawyer was like, listen, you know, they're going to outspend you. Yeah. They have more money than you did. They have more money. You know, you're not going to win this. And so we changed our name to mission six zero. And we said, okay, well mission, we'll keep that, you know, continuity there. Uh, from the mission essential and you know the mission comes first and we really like that idea six is you know the, the unit designator for the commander or means you know i've got your six i've got your back right. and a zero for us it means that everybody starts out at the same level nobody's better than anybody else you know i'll check all your egos at the door we're all at this baseline of zero when we start our training and then we said m60 the m60 the the pig or the hog you know, the most casualty producing weapon on the battlefield during the Vietnam era. It's also the weapon that Green Beret John Rambo used. You know, that was yeah, his I gun. I bumped one around a little bit in my day. They don't have them anymore, you know. Now, we don't use the M60 anymore, but uh, we wanted to use that. And we thought that was awesome. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, that, is an, that is a great story. Tell me, you know, uh, uh, go back to, you know, I'm glad you don't have the Dallas Cowboys uh, character flaw, you know, that so many of us uh, Washington fans recognize and other people. So, uh, you know, I'm a longtime Washington football team fan. Uh, it, you know, I got to give a shout out to Alex Smith for what he did. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to meet him. Uh, I, I don't know if he's got a future being a quarterback, but Damn, he's almost a Disney movie in what he did this year. But Oh, there's going to be a Disney movie. And I'm a huge Washington football team fan. And Ron Rivera is a buddy of mine. And that guy is as authentic as they come. He's a huge yeah. military supporter. Great coach. Took the team from last place to first place this year. Got into the playoffs. Got them playing well. And they're not done yet. Yeah. And Alex Smith, I don't know Alex Smith at all. Um, you know, I've, I've watched him from afar being a, you know, Redskins fan. And just impressed with him. And there's no doubt that 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 his journey, his his story is going to be a Disney movie one day. My you know, my thought was, you know, they'd let him take a snap, you know, one snap and he'd retire. And it would have been an awesome story. What he did this year is beyond incredible, in my opinion. Um, hey, let's let's shift a little bit. Tell me about Warrior Rising. You know, here here you're empowering veterans through fellowship and support and education. Talk about uh, that organization as well. How does that dovetail in with what you're doing? Yeah, no, absolutely. Warrior Rising is a, is a passion project of mine. So we started Warrior Rising in 2015, so five years running. And we help veterans in the most altruistic way we know how. We help them help themselves. And we do that by helping them create or accelerate their own businesses. And it's kind of started... Uh, After an event with the Oakland Raiders, a lot of the guys that I brought out to be instructors or um, uh, wounded warriors, you know, guys that have been injured in combat. And after the event was over, we were talking about life and how things were. And, you know, I'm an officer, so I was always uh, kind of, it's been internalized to me to make sure my guys are taken care of. And I was just asking them, how are things going? Is there anything I can do for you? And so forth. And, and, uh, you know, the guys were telling me about we get large disability checks from the government. There's all sorts of charities that take us hunting and fishing. And I was like, that's great, man. I'm glad to hear it. And, uh, and one of the guys said, you know, it's not that great. Jay. I know. Why isn't it great? Like talk, talk to me. What, what's going on? I said, well, you know, we never asked for any of this stuff. We, we don't aspire to be charity cases. We don't want these handouts. You know, we go on these hunting and fishing trips and we have a good time, but we come back home and nothing's changed at all, you know? And, and I don't want to seem ungrateful for these trips, but, you know, really it's just me having one good day. You know, yeah. I want to live a, I want to live a good life, you know, and, and we talked about that. People that are helping feel better, but the veteran doesn't necessarily have a long-term impact. See, that's the thing. It's like a long-term impact. Like, how are you really helping this guy? And, and I, I get this all the time. I get people saying, Jason, I need you to motivate me. And I tell them, hey, I, I can't motivate you. I can only inspire you to motivate yourself because I'm not going to be here 24-7. I can't hold your hand the whole time. I can only provide you the tools and the knowledge and the experience necessary to, for you to do it yourself. And that's how I look at charity as well. Like I can take you hunting and you're going to have a great time. Then you're going to go back home and what's going to be 
different, nothing. You know, as a matter of fact, it's worse for a lot of these guys because all they do is wait for the next hunting trip or fishing trip, right? And we need to create something where it can be sustainable, where, where they can do it themselves and they can build something, they can create something themselves, you know, and, and really what it came down to was purpose. You know, they had a very strong purpose in the military and as well as a community. How do we recreate that? And so that's why we created Warrior Rising to provide that purpose and community again for veterans. And I think, you know, we all ask the same question when we leave the military, now what? What am I going to do with myself? And for some, I think it's, I need to get help. I'm, I'm, I'm suffering, you know, mentally, emotionally, or physically. I need to talk to someone. I need to go to physical therapy. I need to do something to get help before I can pursue anything else. And I respect that. And that's, that's fantastic. And you just need to be honest with yourself about that. For some guys, it's, hey, I'm never going to start a business. I have no desire to start a business. I just need a job. I need to make money. That's totally fine. There are some fantastic nonprofits out there that are helping veterans find jobs. And for some veterans, it's like, you know what? I want to create my own empire. I want to create my own business. I want to be self-sufficient and self-reliant. I want to start a business. How do I do that? And that's where Warrior Rising comes in. We say, all right, it's going to be hard. You're going to have to do the work, but if you've done the work that we ask you to do, then you've earned the right to um, have the opportunity to get funded, you know, um, and get introduced to our network and grow your business. You have a network of angels that are interested in veteran led businesses. We do the process and we refine this throughout the years. It works like this. If you have an idea or you already have a business, you come to Warrior Rising and we do an intake call with you. So one of our specialists that's been trained will sit down with you and have a personal call with you about your business idea, where you're at in life, what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and they're going to tell you the hard truth. If it's a good idea, if it's a bad idea, if it's, it's a good idea for you or a bad idea for you and just listen to you. And it's your decision whether or not you want to move forward. And by nature, it's not inherently intended to be a negative conversation. It's just supposed to be an authentic, real conversation. And, and right. it always is. And we've had thousands of these conversations, right? And uh, if, if you feel good about it, you move on to our next phase, which is the Warrior Academy. You go through a 40-video curriculum, a training platform, sort of like a mini MBA course that translates the military operations order into a business model. And at the end of that, you submit your, your business plan, and we take a look at it and we introduce you, if ever, you've done all the work, introduce you to a mentor. And you and the mentor, uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship and together you create a go-to-market strategy. And then you come back to Warrior Rising and you say, hey, we're ready for financial assistance. And, and we say, all right, well, we'll see if you've um, qualified for a grant from us or, uh, and or an investment opportunity. And so we have a network of private, um, private donors, VC firms, angel firms, you know, corporations that might be interested in, in investing in your company. Like no guarantees there. You still have to give a, a very strong, successful pitch, you know, and then you and that entity or that person negotiate some sort of relationship. And uh, and then after that, it's 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 not we give you a high five and do, go do great things. It's stay with us in this community, help your fellow military brothers and sisters, you know, we'll continue to help you and, uh, and we'll go from there. Is there a particular success story maybe that comes to mind of, uh, you know, somebody that's come through and has got a good business going, give them a little bit of a shout out. So, so many, um, you know, amazing veteran businesses. And there's always two that, that come to mind that are really special to me. They're, they're good friends of mine. One is Justin Clapsaddle. He, um, he was an enlisted uh, Army guy, Fort Bragg, North Carolina paratrooper. And he lives in North Carolina, North Carolina right now. And he has a company called Clapsaddle Custom Knives, uh, doing business also as war metal knives. Mm -hmm. And so he came to me and said, Jason, I want to, I learned how to grind knives and I want to, I want to create a business that sells knives. You know, I said, well, Justin, that's fantastic. I'm happy for you, man. Let me see some of your knives. And they were really high quality, beautiful knives. And I said, well, there's a lot of knife makers out there, Justin. And he said, yeah, there are. What's going to set you apart? Why are you different? And he's like, well, I don't know, man. <laughs> and I said, well, you need a story. 
He's like, yeah, I need a story. I'm like, you're a military guy. He's like, yeah. I'm like, well, let's think about this. And so I was walking around, um, you know, my, uh, my, um, my unit and I saw some vehicles that were destroyed that were taken back from combat. And I, I remember my vehicle on my second deployment, the Humvee that I was riding in was destroyed, completely destroyed. And I thought, what if we took the, the metal from that vehicle, just scrap really, you know, and, and gave it to Justin and had him forge a knife out of it. That knife would be really special to me, yeah. you know, and I would, it would be an heirloom and I would be able to tell the story about how my Humvee got blown up by an IED and tell the stories of the guys on my team and that whole thing. And then I thought, well, you know, I know a lot of guys that got blown up and they still have shrapnel in their bodies. I wonder if they'd want to give their shrapnel to Justin and he could turn that into a knife or repurpose oh it. <laughs> and then I thought, well, you know, I, I've, I've been to some places where they have vehicles that were destroyed in combat, not just from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, but also from Vietnam and World War II and the Korean War and World War I and even the Civil War. And I, you know, coming from Virginia, yeah, you go out in the woods in certain locations, you can find all sorts of crazy, you know, artifacts. Right. In the Civil War. And I, and I found uh, some metal that was once a part of a vehicle, a Sherman tank that fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And I gave it to Justin. And Justin found some, uh, some metal from a Jeep that was in World War II. And he started forging these knives out of this metal. And he, he uh, incorporates Damascus steel into some of these as, as well. So it has that really cool, you know, shine and it's, it's very strong and everything. And, um, you know, we want to give it to. This thing's got to be flying off the shelves. Not yet. Not yet. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> well, I mean, tell you, it's, a, it's an awesome, it's an awesome idea. I, I think so too. I gave that idea to Justin and he's run with it. And uh, I, I think he's going to be a millionaire. He, he's a, uh, you know, I, I I always think of the positive and the big picture and I kind of see the potential and everything. And, and Justin's a little bit different. He's like, well, I don't know if it, I'm like, Justin, I'm telling you, man, people will love this. If, if Justin has a website, let's be sure to put a link to that in the show notes when we get done. Um, hey, uh, uh, let me, let me uh, tackle another thing here. You've written this book called deliberate discomfort and yeah. um I have started reading it. I'm, I, I, I am not all the Thank way you. through it. I, I wish that uh, I wish that I was. But you're a good storyteller, and so you, uh, in the course of the book, you've got about a dozen stories that I think you've woven into uh, some lessons. How did you? Um, God, I, I talked to a lot of guys who, who've written books. Uh, you're not a Navy SEAL, so you know you're already outside of the, uh, <laughs> the natural <laughs> author track. But but uh, you know what? When did you decide to write a book? How does somebody become an author? I wonder about that sometimes. You know, um, I'm an ambitious guy. I mean, just look at my bio, my resume. You, you can tell that you know I, I go after things and. And that being said, I fail probably 90% of the time. And the 10% is, is only what people are seeing, the tip of the iceberg. And I, I don't mind failing, you know, like you just kind of understand it's a learning opportunity. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And I, on my bucket list years and years and years ago, I, I just randomly haphazardly put, write a book one day. And I remember my grandmother, when she was still alive, you know, during my first combat rotation, she was like, you should write a book and you should write a book. And I was like, no, what am I going to write about? I'm 26 years old. You know what I mean? I don't have any life experiences. And um, she sort of kind of made me promise her that I would do something one day. And I, I said I would, but I didn't really think much about it. And, you know, and I, as I was building Mission 6-0 up, I saw what some of our competitors were doing. Obviously, you keep an eye out on them. And uh, I saw some of them writing books and, you know, a couple of them were bestseller, New York Times, you know, the whole thing. And what I noticed was when we would go after clients in the very beginning, when we were competing, I would win most of those contracts. And after they wrote the book, their businesses just skyrocketed, you know, and, and, um, and I was like, that's the key. That's the secret. I should write a book. We should have a book for the company. And so I, I kind of had that back in my mind and I was like, well, what should I write about? I don't want to, you know, force the issue. I want to be inspired. I want to be able to, you know, write something that I'm, I'm proud of and I'm, I'm knowledgeable about. So for years, I sort of 
kept a, a list of, of ideas of what I wanted to write about, of stories, of things that, you know, I've, I've experienced with clients and things that I've, I've said to clients that have really resonated with them. And I compiled all those stories together and I, uh, I wrote the book, Deliberate Discomfort, in February of, of last year. So it's been out for about a year. It sold uh, 20,000 copies uh, so far, which we're proud of. Uh, it's a number one Amazon bestseller, which is great. And we're going to continue to sell and continue to, to get after it. How U.S. special operations overcome fear and dare to win by getting comfortable being uncomfortable yeah. is sort of the tagline on the book. And, and, and I, I guess that the individuals are in the book uh, are a little bit of you and, and, uh, and, and other people that have, uh, that you've crossed paths with, you kind of change the names to protect the innocent, but uh, you know, these are an amalgam of individuals that can teach some great lessons. Yeah. I wanted to do it. I want to write the book a little bit differently. Uh, than what you've seen. So each chapter focuses on different theme in our total warrior model. And it's my journey uh, as a Green Beret, just after I, I earned the Green Beret and walking into my company commander, my, um, my unit's office for the first time, and him sitting me down in chapter one and saying, all right, Jason, we're going to combat in a month. And this is true, you know, and he's, and he's saying, in order for you, for you to be successful, this is what I need you to know and to learn. And uh, we have a certain culture here and I want you to talk to these individuals in the company to find out what makes them tick because these are special guys. And once you feel like you've learned what I'm asking you to come back and report to me what you, what you have learned. And so each chapter is me meeting a different individual, having a conversation with them, learning something new and having a, from their perspective, you know, and then having a scientist break that down to relatable and actionable um, uh, digestible items so you can take that with you and apply it to your own personal and professional life. And then uh, the third section in these chapters of practical applications will say, how do you apply this um, to your business, right? And this is an example, or your life, and this is an example of, of, of one such thing. And so uh, it's this unique book and it's highly reviewed. It's, it's I think, 4.8 stars out of five on, on Amazon right now. The Audible is even higher. I think we're at 4.9 stars which is really tough to get. I read the whole thing, um, you know, for audible.com, but mm. I'm proud of it. And if uh, anybody in your audience finds value in it, uh, you can check it out. At I'm, I'm, I'm devouring the book right now uh, and enjoying it. I think it would be a great, uh, team exercise, you know, if you had a group of people to sit down and read, you know, you know, kind of in, you know, in your company book club, so to speak, uh, you know, and go through it together because of the lessons, because there's so much to talk about and a lot of, a lot of act, like say actionable stuff at the end of each chapter to go through. I want to cover one more thing before we run out of time. And that's it. You got the mission six zero challenge going on. I want to give a shout out to uh, one of our mutual friends, John McCaskill uh, saw him doing burpees and running laps uh, on a little video recently out in uh, Colorado. So, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll uh, appropriately tag him, but tell me about the mission six zero challenge. And, and I'm, I'm scared by the time this conversation's over with, you're going to throw the gauntlet down for me. So anyway, to have at it. Well, the gauntlet's thrown, Bob. If you want to join us, please there do. Go. We've got a great community, you know, and uh, it's called the Mission Six Zero Deliberate Discomfort Challenge. So right after the book, the curriculum that we teach is, is deliberate discomfort. It's the total warrior mindset, whole person concept. And so we wanted to do something special for our community and and we said, let's create a challenge for 60 days, 60 straight days. You're going to complete the following requirements. No excuses, no failure. You have to do it, right? Mentally, you have to read a book every single week. And you get to pick the book. We offer you a library of books to choose from. The only caveat is that uh, in week one, you have to read Deliberate Discomfort. So we all get on the same page. I'm, I'm two days in already. <laughs> Love it. Physically, you know, you have to work out uh, twice a day. You do a, a gym workout program and you do a cardio workout program. And each workout is about 60 minutes in duration. And then you follow a nutrition plan. We can provide you a nutrition plan or you can uh, select your own. 
And then if you want to do an upgrade, we can actually have meals delivered to your house, prepared meals delivered Listen, to your house. Listen, I, I need this because, you know, you know, they have the freshman 15. I think I've put on the COVID-19 myself, yeah, uh, you know, that, adding weight. I gotta, I gotta get, I gotta get the discipline back. I hear you. That's what prompted me. And then in the summertime, I was like, man, uh, not going to the gym and doing all this. Really, I was, I was really overweight, you know, for me. And uh, I did this as a beta test in the summer. I lost 34 pounds and uh, just regained those habits that, that I had lost. And it was, it was amazing. Uh, but mentally, physically, spiritually, John McCaskill, Navy SEAL commander, the, the gentleman that you referred to earlier, he's created a mindfulness practice for, for our spiritual strength. And every day you listen to uh, uh, an audio recording of John taking you through a mindfulness exercise, which, which is really hard. Um, it is I the meditation it, side of it, I've found. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 uh, but, but very useful stuff. Jason, I, 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 this, this happens to me every time I get a guest on and we promise to, you know, to, we're, 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 and in it good, we're bumping up against the deadline. So we've been talking with Jason Van Camp. Again, he's a 2001 West Point graduate, chairman of Mission 60, executive director of Warrior Rising, and the author of the book, Deliberate Discomfort, How U.S. Special Operations Overcome Fear, and dare to win by getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Jason, I can't thank you enough for being on the program. Uh, uh, six months from now, uh, I want to get you back. And you've thrown down the gauntlet on the challenge. So I got to get up to speed, got to start. So no excuses. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thanks, Bob. It was my honor to be here as well. Hey, you've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. We publish on Tuesdays and Fridays. We're available on all your favorite podcast platforms and on our YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much to Jason Van Camp. Bravo Zulu to you. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at VeteranCrowdNetwork.com. We'll see you next time.